All righty, and we are live. Hello, everybody. Welcome along to Historic Garden. So happy that you are here. Want to acknowledge our magnificent mods and all of the fans of Historic Gardens everywhere, because they are everywhere. This time around, we're going to be traveling, not really back in time, well, kind of, sort of, but we're going to this awesome place called the Cloisters and the Gardens, specifically the Heather Garden. So sit back and pour yourself a cup of coffee. Manny, do you have a cup of coffee with you? No? No, it's way too late for that, Scott. All righty. Well, if you had one, uh, some of the gnomies like to have a cup of uh, coffee or a tankard of tea or sometimes even a mug of mead or a chalice of cider. That's always exciting. Or a flagon. If you happen to have a flagon laying around, grab your flagon, fill it with any beverage of your choice and just kind of hang out with us. So um, hey, everybody, that's Manny right there. Manny, do you want to tell everybody who you are? Well, thank you very much, Scott. I really appreciate that. And uh, welcome, Nomies of the world out there. And of course, welcome, welcome, welcome to all my uh, fans from my uh, true crime days. I really appreciate it. Um, well, what I am is a, a landscaper, a fine gardener, an estate, a boutique gardener here in New York City. I've been doing this since 2008. I was trained at the, uh, at, actually at the garden that we saw in our last episode, Wave Hill. And um, after that endeavor, I started my own fine gardening business here in New York, where by 2019, I was taking care of 10, 11 huge properties in New York City, as well as having a very, very stellar career at the famous New York Botanical Gardens as an instructor. Uh, unfortunately, all that uh, kind of went by the wayside the last couple of years, but uh, still out here doing my thing and still out here um, you know, trying to educate people about plants, garden design, uh, and now about historic gardens. So thank you, Scott, for the opportunity. And of course, you and I, Scott, are joined by a very special guest today who was a last minute addition, but a perfect addition to the uh, to the to the stream today because we're joined by the famous Leslie Day here for, here in New York City. And Leslie is, a, is an old friend of mine, as well as a colleague from NYBG Days. And uh, she also uh, lived in this area um, for quite a while of the Fort Tryon Park, Heather Garden, Cloisters area. And Leslie was also a, a tour guide and a volunteer gardener at the Heather Garden. So her additions today should be invaluable for us. And uh, we're very happy to have her. Hey, Leslie, thank you for joining. You, you've officially Amen. left Thanks Leslie again. nothing to say. Thank you. <laughs> oh, sorry. Thank you. Leslie. Leslie, is there anything to add to that? If so, please do so. Oh, yes. Tell about your, your yeah, about your website, too. We'll get your website up. Yeah. Well, so Leslie, give, uh, we, an intro. we moved to Washington Heights in, in 2011 after having lived on a houseboat at the Bow Base in 79th Street for 36 years. And we chose that area because it was right across the street from Fort Tryon Park, which is just the most gorgeous park and right along the Hudson River um, with this three acre botanical garden called the Heather Garden, which Manny's going to take you on a tour of. Well, we're both going to do it, for, and uh, that's what I'm very excited about today. And of course, Leslie, you're an author as well as a, a gardener and an a, and a garden educator. Would you um, let's let's tell the audience about your website and what kind of books that you have out? Thank you, Manny. So I write books about the natural world of New York City. I've written books about the parks, the street trees, the birds, honeybees. Um, you can check them out on leslieday.nyc. Perfect. Very cool. All right. Well, let's get rolling. But uh, before we do, you know, um, we have fans and we also have super fans. Well, there happens to be a very lovely lady named Chrissy who has just become one of the members. So she gets to hang out with all the nomies and the time travelers and gets to know all kinds of cool secret super duper stuff. So we're happy to have Chrissy along with us, along with so many others. So thanks, Chrissy. Good to see you here. All right, let's get rolling, you guys. So I'm going to tell everybody, I used to live um, not too far, I guess, from here, and um, but I didn't go too often, um, which is surprising now, even to me, to be honest with you. But you know how it is, especially when you live in Manhattan, it's like everything else doesn't exist. It's like, oh, God, all right, Manhattan. But, you know, 
I will just skip over that stuff. You know, there's New York, there's Manhattanites, there's New Yorkers, and then there's everybody else. So let's go ahead and jump over to it. In fact, I even have a map showing. See, this is like my neck of the woods, you know, West 72nd Street, South. But it's all the way up there, but really beautiful. I mean, really, yeah. really great. I mean, how do you get there? You just, you drove a car, right? Kind of zoomed on Me, I, Yeah, I just drive, or you could take the one train to here. It's The uh, A train, the A train. The, the A train, train sorry. The A train is the most direct, correct. And this is the, uh, Leslie, tell us about the topography of this area, uh, uh, as opposed to like, you know, Midtown Manhattan. What what yeah, makes this area of Manhattan? There's, it's very, it's very rocky. Um, and there's three or four or five levels to this park. Um, because it sits on top of Manhattan Schist, which is the bedrock of Manhattan Island. But then once you go downhill, um, you get to the the Inwood Valley, um, and that the bedrock there is marble. Marble. And and that and it really is the valley. It's very low. So to walk up from where I lived on Bennett Avenue or Broadway. You know, it's very hard to walk up the hill. <laughs> so there are elevators that take you in the 190th Street A train station. But they were out for a year because they were replacing them. And so we had to walk up, um, which was really hard on me, being the age I'm at. Um, but, it, you know, it's just a, a really beautiful park. Yeah, this is the highest point in in all of New York City. In fact, well, the, yeah, Bennett Park, and and this is the site of um, uh, where Washington, uh, George Washington, had his fort, and where Revolutionary War battles were fought. Yeah, right, exactly. In, yeah, incredible place. I mean, I used to live near New Rochelle, and so I think uh, at the time I was probably closer that from to New, New Rochelle, right? Which is right around here, sort right of. up a little bit. Yeah. And then, well, Westchester County, right? Kind of midway. Uh, but anyway, but it's like a zillion miles as far as I'm concerned from over here. But <laughs> all right, let's get rolling. Let's talk about the cloisters very quick because I think people will find that fascinating. Because, I mean, honestly, people think of New York, right? They think of historic sites. They think of the gardens. They think, I'm sorry, they, and yeah, and they think of the museums. They don't normally think about stuff like this. So the cloisters is actually a museum. It's in um, that whole Washington Heights neighborhood, Upper Manhattan. And it was way back in 1927 when uh, Rockefeller hired Frederick Law Olmsted Jr., who is one of the sons of the designers of Central Park, uh, to sort of create a park in the Fort Washington area. And then a few years later, Rockefeller said, hey, I'll build these cloisters for you. And so he purchased the, um, the museum site and just started, you know, he put up the money for all of this stuff to get rolling. And the music, I'm sorry, the museum, like you said, is situated in Fort Tryon Park. And it's it's pretty cool. I mean, you've got European medieval art, art and some, you know, Romanesque, Gothic type stuff, large collection of medieval artworks. And it's set in this sort of French monastery kind of abbey, uh, you know, abbeys. And it's, it's really, it's, it's, it's a time travel adventure, isn't it? And, yeah, yeah and, and I actually have a question for Leslie, and um, and forgive me, Leslie, if I'm asking you a question that you don't know, but I've always heard that this was like a castle from Europe that they brought over to New York City. Is that true? Yeah, they brought over some of the original cloisters from Europe, mm -hmm. and then they also built some that to look like them. Mm. Um, but one of the, for me, the great things about the cloisters are the gardens, the medieval gardens. Yes. Um, because all of, of the plants that create the dyes for the unicorn tapestries are grown there. And they wow. have, so they have medicinal plants, they have plants for dyes, they have plants that are supposed, supposedly great for magic. Um, the Bonifant gardens at the cloisters are, are, are just amazing. Um, I, you know, the, the religious artwork is one thing, but the living gardens are pretty cool. And okay, these well, are let's get started then in talking about that. I'll just show, I think that's the last photo. I'll we'll just have a few more. You know, that's pretty much it. So just to let everybody know about it being there. And now let's just talk about the gardens. Do you want me to pull up the, um, the PDF or your video, Manny? Uh, let's pull up the PDF first. Um, we can talk about the Heather Garden. And of course, the uh, um, Leslie will do the heavy lifting on the history of this place. But from what I know, this is another sort of like, you know, 
one of the themes running through these garden shows, Scott, has been so far, of course, the Hudson Valley. We've been mm-hmm. dealing with Untermeyer Park, Wave Hill, and now, of course, the Heather Garden. And another theme that kind of um, runs through all this is the Rockefeller family, of course. And uh, the Rockefeller family owned Kaikwit Estate up, up in Tarrytown. And their uh, landscape designer, William Wells Bosworth, designed Untermeyer Park. But the Rockefeller family was directly involved in this in this whole Fort Tryon Heather Garden uh, genesis. And um, Leslie, why don't you take over from here? Give us a little history of the Heather Garden and uh, and and what we're going to see in the video. So John D. Rockefeller Jr. Um, used to spend time in northern Manhattan and, and walk around. He loved nature. And when the land came up for sale, it had been owned by Cornelius Billings. <clears throat> who was um, a a very wealthy industrialist from Chicago. Um, His family owned uh, a Coke, C-O-K, a company uh, that that controlled all the utilities in Chicago. He was, you know, a multi, multi multi-millionaire. And he had bought all this land up that ultimately became Fort Tryon Park. Um, He was a racehorse enthusiast and he had stables there um, on, in his estate, and he used to race them um, at the Harlem River Speedway, which then became Harlem River Drive. And um, he then fell in love with the automobile, so he wanted to sell the land, get rid of the stables, buy cars, and um, Rockefeller Jr. bought it up because he wanted to make a park for the people of the city of New York. He wanted them to look out on the Hudson River and the Palisades. And he even bought property on the Palisades so that no one would build there. So the people of the city would have this beautiful view across the river. And right. I always, I always found that to be quite <laughs> like, hey, let's just amazing. buy, yeah, let's just amazing buy the property. How generous the that river. is, right? Yeah. Oh, so generous. And, you know, he was such a visionary because he and, and many other philanthropists saw that the Palisades were being destroyed. Uh, they were being blown up uh, for rocks to be used uh, for the streets of the New York. Um, and they wanted to protect the Palisades at the same time. Anyway, as you said, he hired uh, uh, Frederick Law Olmsted's sons, son and stepson, to design Fort Tryon Park. And they had been traveling in Europe and they realized the site was very much like, like Scotland um, because it, you know, it was very thin soil, exposed to the winds off the river. And so they brought in a lot of heathers and they, um, and they named it the Heather Garden. Now, um, before we, before we continue, we have to explain to the, uh, to the layman, um, the, the Heather you know, what are Heathers and why are Heathers so good for this environment of the, uh, well, of the Heather Garden here at Fort Tryon? Right. So these these are evergreen shrubs. Uh, they grow very low because they have to withstand heavy winds. Um, they, um, the, 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 heaths, the heaths bloom in the winter and the Heathers bloom in the summer. And so you have these these beautiful evergreen shrubs blooming year round. Right. Um, and they're, and they're beautiful colors of pastels, purples, pinks, uh, some whites. And of course, um, I believe they're in the Ericaceae family, which means, I think that, so. yeah, which means that they require pretty much the same cult of, uh, soil as um, rhododendrons, azaleas. And uh, of course, at the uh, you guys are going to see some beautiful examples of azalea and, and rhododendron today mixed in with the, with the heathers. But um, yeah, heathers are a great plant to use, guys, if you have high winds, uh, particularly if you're near water um, the, uh, and the winds coming off of rivers and such, because really that's their natural environment, you know, in the, in the Scottish moorlands. Leslie? Right. So... Um... They created this exquisite garden, and uh, John D. Rockefeller Jr. paid for everything. He had the whole park landscaped. Ultimately, they bought the land down along Broadway. And um, the Rockefeller family, through the Greenacre Foundation, still helped support this park. But during the 1970s and 80s, when the city was broke, you know, they didn't keep the park up and the weeds took over. And then eventually the Fort Tryon Park Trust was formed 
I don't know, 20, 15, 20 years ago. And the Rockefeller family got involved again. And um, and they have a wonderful gardener, John Kelly, and lots of volunteers from the neighborhood, mostly retired people uh, who come at least once a week, if not twice a week, even during the pandemic, to prune, to weed, to plant. It's, it's just a small army of people who love gardening and they rely on them and they're worth their weight in gold. I mean, I did it for a long time until it was really hard for me to bend. And then I would just, I would just prune the butterfly bushes so I could stand up. <laughs> I don't really go there anymore. We moved up to Riverdale, uh, but I love that group of people and they take such good care of that garden. Yeah, I was there the other day for the first time in uh, probably about a year. I did a, I did a video there last year around this time and uh, it just looked gorgeous. I mean, the upkeep is amazing. The, 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 the designs are amazing. Uh, just really everything about that park impressed the hell out of me. Right. Um, they, they hired uh, Rhonda Brands and her partner, I can't think of her name, um, to, to hew closely to the Olmsted Brothers plan. The original. And, the original. And, you know, it is a little botanical garden, and but it's open 24-7. So, you know, there's no gates to keep it closed. Um, the wildlife there is fantastic. You know, the hawks and, and falcons and every kind of songbird you can imagine. Um, and so there are plants from all over the world, not just native plants, but many native plants too. Right. See, that's why, I mean, this is, of course, a philosophical discussion that some people in the gardening community get all angry about. But I, I'm, I've never been a gardener that was like that favored native plants over any other plant. My, my whole deal was always, is it invasive or is it or is it not invasive? Right. Is that it a good neighbor? If it's a good neighbor and can live in the community without killing everyone else, right? Right. Then it right. should stay. <laughs> Right, exactly. It's been there a long time. Now, you know, almost 100 years. Exactly. So, so, Scott, you were, you're showing some of these beautiful, uh, you know, kind of up close pictures and heathers. Um, oh, well, there's we'll also a um, there's also a photo data bank. So a bunch of us worked really hard for years. Uh, uploading photos of all the different plants and naming them. So oh, no now point. if you go on to forttryandparktrust.org, you can look up all the plants. Forttryandparktrust.org. All right. So we'll try to get that into the chat as well. So, yeah. And, and for people who want to visit New, uh, New York City and you want to see this place, you would take the A train and then take the elevator right up and it's free. To 190th Street. 190th Street and then just take the elevator right up and it's literally right there. And um, the Heather Garden is free. I'm not quite sure of the cloisters because the, the. Yeah, the cloisters is, is owned by the Metropolitan Museum of Art. Right. So yeah. You're a member, you become a member or you have to pay. But every yeah, when I. The last the last time I was at the Met, I, I think the ticket is good for a couple of days, maybe that you can go and use that same ticket that you paid. I mean, for God knows for what they're charging these days, they better give you. But you know, know it is pretty much pay, pay what you wish. So oh, they still have that. You, yeah, you, I, you can go in and give them a job. Yeah, oh. well, they only do that. Yeah, if you if you can prove that you're a New Yorker, uh, we're the only ones that could do that. Tourists, they don't do that. No. Too, so. Seriously, I don't think so. They never asked Trust us me. for, for it ID. Happened, it happened to me uh. through a few months ago. <laughs> I was with somebody, and I and uh, I he's like, "Well, how much is it?" You know, because it's a crazy amount of money. And um, you know, it used to be, yeah, you could just pay what you wanted. Anybody could do that. Yeah. And when I was living, I used to live a few blocks from there on the east side, right? I prefer the west side, but I just live on the east side, so I used to go there all the time. And um, you know, sometimes when you have a, a heat wave, right? And you know, the air can, it's just, it's a nightmare to even stay in your apartment. So I'm like, oh, well, go to the museum because, you know, it's always going to work there. So I was going there every single day. And it's like, there's no way I was going to give them 25 or $30 every freaking day. So it's like, look, I'm, you know, five bucks, 10 bucks. I'm just going there to get air conditioning. Um, but now, no, unless, you, I mean, if you're in New York you, and you can prove it, fine. But tourists, no, you got to pay. It's like Disney World. <laughs> But yeah, they the really way, you get into the cloisters. Yeah, they really it really became a uh I don't know. When did the Met take over that place, Leslie? Do you know? Oh, a long time ago. I think right from the get-go. Oh, no kidding. Okay. Yeah. 
I used to know the uh, the 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 head of horticulture there. His name was Caleb Leach. Oh, uh, Caleb uh, is great. He's great. Yeah, he, he moved several great, years yeah. ago. Yeah, yeah, he lived in a building that I used to landscape at, and uh -huh. so we became friendly. Um, but I think him so and his family moved page. up to Massachusetts. This is the last page of this PDF. So, is there anything else that you wanted to show in here? Otherwise, we can get to the video. No, I wish that some of these plants that we uh, I show I had on our video, particularly that globe thistle that we just saw, uh, which is um, Echinops, this one right here, the globe, the blue gray ball here at the bottom. Mm -hmm. uh, that's a killer looking plant. But I got some excellent footage, and I think the uh, I think everyone's going to really like it. So why don't we just get into the video and? Um, I'll just sort of talk. Leslie, feel free. We're, so we're here at the entrance here at the um, just real quick. Uh, this is what people will see if they if, when they get out of the A train, correct? Yeah. So they come up and they go around the Margaret Corbin circle named for the Revolutionary War hero, Margaret Corbin. And then you walk right into the Heather Garden. Right, just like this gentleman here, and just like I'm about to do here. And of course, I took this two days ago, so solidly in the in the, basically right in the middle of fall. And um, you just just wanted to give people, you know, a little bit of where we are, Fort Giant Park, and all that kind of stuff. But um, I think I just saw a stewardia there. Not quite sure if that was a steward. Is that a? St yeah, no, no, no. There are some. There are a couple of stewardias, but um, I don't oh. think that that is one. Oh, I thought I just saw one. So here we're seeing some hollies and, you know, I'm just kind of just want to show, wanted to show people the, um, the lay of the land right at the Southern entrance of this park. And of course, lots of shade. So we have a lot of, um, witch hazel right here. Seeing, we're seeing turning some rhododendrons. What are we seeing here? It's a weeping cherry. Correct. That's a beautiful weeping cherry. Yeah. And of course going to its beautiful fall color and, um, it was very sunny out, so sometimes it gets a little washed out. But we are right there on the Hudson River. I'm going to walk down to it fairly soon, and uh, I like the way they have this place maintained. It's not, um, it's they're not like crazy about getting all the leaves off of everything. It has that nice naturalistic look. Excellent use of annuals too, by the way. Yeah. So there you're seeing some azaleas over there. That's an azalea right there. Uh, and just really well designed. Notice how a lot of the plants right up front are short. You know, I, I just went through this in my design class for people. And, and you know, proper design means you want to be able to see every plant in the, in, the, in the motif, in the composition. So the plants in the front should be a little bit shorter than, the, and, and everything should sort of elevate up as you go towards the interior of the garden or the rear of the garden. And so really well designed here and um, excellent use of color, texture. So this is an Artemisia, correct? Yes. And a really nice pairing with that spruce in the back. Yes. Similar colors, but um, and similar texturally too. But yeah, uh, it smells so good. When you look yeah, it. the smell of that wormwood is really nice. And uh, so we'll be heading down to see the river in a second. And of course, um, it's always a pet peeve of mine, Leslie, that people leave leaves on shrubs. I can't stand that, but. It doesn't look so bad there. It's a very small group of gardeners there that are bad. <laughs> maybe two. Oh, really? That's it? Yeah, yeah, that was wow. And this is a majestic tree. This is, uh, what is this, a sycamore? London, London Plain. Yeah, beautiful tree. So we're heading down to uh, slowly to the river there. And of course, there we're seeing the wonderful ground cover named Liriope. And uh, just helping out the gardener there. Oh, thank you. <laughs> And we see some hellebore in there. And liriope is a very tough, it's called lily turf. It's a very tough ground cover. And, uh, and it flowers in the, uh, it flowers in the fall. I'm not, I'm surprised that that didn't have any flowers on it. And please, Leslie, interject at any moment. There's some beautiful there. Do you want to turn off the, the volume on that, Matt? Uh, let me, uh, let me lower it. Holy cow. I want, I want people to hear a little that bit. Ain't, is, that, is, that a, is that wind or a plane flying over? That's a plane. That's a plane. But yeah, yeah. Leslie just talked about the yews that were there, Y-E-Ws. And yeah, they have they have very mature, beautiful yew trees there. And of and course, those there's are... a, a beautiful white pine on the left. And on the right, you should be approaching the uh, Camperin Down Elms there. Oh, there with the yellow. Wait, go past that. Go past that short tree. 
is a, a camper down elm. On Which the right. one? The on the right. On the, the one that's kind of yeah. clipped. This yes. one right here. Yes. Yes. That's an elm. I thought that yeah, was a cherry. Yeah, it's a camper down elm. Wow. And it, you know, it's known for its kind of gnarly branches. It looks very fairy tale like. Right. If I'd have known it was so special, I would have. I would have. Yeah. Um, maybe I do actually look at it here. Yeah, I do actually because I thought oh, it was. Good. Yeah. You can see. Yeah. See. Yeah, in fact, I want to pause that because it looks like a face right here. Look at that. Yep. It looks like a nose and a mouth. Oh. Yeah, that's wild. There's one on either end of that little area. Uh huh. Yeah, really, really excellently landscaped. Oh, and so there's now, the river. And there's the famous river. And, you know, everybody who knows my work knows that the Hudson River always makes an appearance at some point mm -hmm. in, in my mm -hmm. videos. Um, even in the even in the true crime work that I did, it all mm -hmm. took place in Untermeyer Park, Yonkers, you know, just a little bit up the road from here. So we're heading back up to the gardens proper. Yeah, that's great that that's an elm. I didn't know that. I, I yeah. thought that, that was another weeping, I don't know, another weeping cherry. It's like a weeping elm. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> that's, that's the form. Yeah, it's really nice. And, of course, elms are dying now in New York, uh, apparently. They're all getting diseased. Yeah. I mean, it's been 100 years. Millions, tens of millions of American elms have died. Right. The Dutch elm disease. But right. here in Fort Tryon Park, they've raised money and they pay arborists to come and inoculate the elms to keep them from getting this disease. That's good. So there's a little bit of the U's that we were talking about. Taxis is the proper uh, Latin name for those. And um, we were just looking before at some uh, Prunus lorosaurasis, but there's some, it looks like hydrangea. And you know, it's funny because there's a, a, a other than the heathers, a lot of these gardens that I show use a lot of the same plants, but we're seeing them in different designs. So these videos are actually really useful for the, uh, for the garden designer to see the same plant in different, in different mm -hmm. contexts. Now, what are we seeing here? Because I always... I always London this... plane tree, which London is, plane. you know, it's a hybrid between the American sycamore and the European plane. Mm. And, and the, um, the gardener for uh, King Charles came over in the 17th century and collected seeds of the American sycamore, brought them back to England, planted them, and they hybridized with the sycamore that's over there to create an entirely new species. Right. Mike, Mike Ruggiero, um, um, I, who's, I don't know if he's still at NYBG, but he used to call those 55 mile an hour trees because you, you could always tell what they are, even if you're driving, because they have that white, <laughs> that characteristic white right. bark at the oh, top. Right. So we're seeing here annuals, and I'm not the greatest uh, identifier of annuals. Yeah, it's probably a salvia. Yeah, it looked like a salvia to me. And of course, here's Amsonia, one oh. of the great perennials. Um, this is normally green. But it, it's it's a tall perennial that gets a beautiful fall color, and this looks like verbena, but I'm not quite sure. Gomphrena. Gomphrena, that's right. Mm -hmm. And then of course here we have Catoni aster next to some juniper, and this is a perfectly uh, a perfect example of using these ground covers, these mm -hmm. creeping ground covers, right at the edge. Using and you can them with see rocks. all the rocks. How you know all the rocks that are at the surface. Correct, and they and they. Shit. And they really use them as part of the landscape brilliantly. These Olmsted guys were great. They were great. What else did they design in New York City? I don't know. I think Central Park. Um, I'm not well, sure whether the, yeah, the, the father, father did. did. The father did, right. Yeah. I was pointing up at a, cat at a Catinus, but uh, we we'll, we'll didn't see it. There's some petunias down there and looking like more salvia. By the way, salvia, for you in the audience, one of the greatest annuals because there's so many of them they're really they, they're such great filler plants always look for for some salvias so there's your intrepid the silhouette of your intrepid reporter <laughs> <laughs> and here is uh another ground cover juniper and this uh, this plant up here always escapes me i don't know what that what that is oh that's salvia that's imagine. that's another salvia yeah there we go it's like very it's velvety beautiful yeah very pretty and look at the color combination between that mm -hmm. and the juniper mm -hmm. i mean perfect co co color combination as i try to tell my students great textural co uh, contrast as well mm -hmm. i mean just brilliant design here and so rod wrote ronda brands she's she was tasked with sort of looking at the original designs and yeah and, yeah 
I guess it makes sense. I mean, why change something that works? Right. But, beautiful. Yeah, beautiful. Heather. I'm not, not sorry. That's not Heather. That's Juniper. And then there's some mm -hmm. asters and ferns. And then here, of course, we're getting into a little shade. So, of course, the gardeners responded by putting an epimedium, E-P-I-M-E-D-U-M, -E which, uh, which is a great ground right. cover as well. And then more Katoni Aster, which everybody pronounces Cotton Easter, <laughs> right? It's like the biggest pet peeve of mine. And uh, not quite sure what we were looking at there, because sometimes these things get washed out. But I love the look of Amsonia, the the uh, the uh, the autumn. It's just gorgeous. Yeah, in the autumn, in the autumn, exactly. So we're walking north now, and it elevate, and you can see the. And there's more Amsonia right there, just a great filler plant, um, a great perennial. It mixes so well with so many other things, and it also gives you that vertical interest, which is very unusual in a, in a, well, not unusual, but very welcome uh, contrast against the horizontal. You see the yucca? You see yeah, the yucca plant it's flowering. There? Yeah. yeah. Oh. Those yeah. are great. Every garden in the Northeast should have at least one or two yuccas for the mm -hmm. for the the textural and the contrast. And so what I was doing there, let me just bring that back a little bit because that was actually an important concept. So notice that these yuccas are very are very a uh, vertical, right? And then and then what I'm going to do is point out the horizontal uh, the hor horizontal lines of the uh, palisades in the background. Mm -hmm. And that is what gives you as a gardener, as a garden designer, the, that interest. You, 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 you juxtapose verticals with horizontals. And, of course, doing it tastefully is the, is the key. Mm. Beautiful hydrangeas underneath a U. And there's more yuccas. They really, they really. Oh look, look it's great. flowering. There's I, I the flower spike. <laughs> I couldn't believe it. That's why I had to show it. It's uh, these things usually flower in the late spring, early summer. And that looked fresh. It wasn't. And this is a uh, lavande, lavender. So great, uh, great color combination there. Great textural combination. And then Do the ground you know the cover. Story of the yucca moth. No, tell us. Okay, so you have to go back to the yucca. Can you Hold do on. that? Sure. Good. Hold it there. Okay. So there's only one animal that pollinates this, and it's the female yucca moth. And she flies in there and she gathers the pollen. Each one of those is a separate flower. And she rolls it in a ball and she has these organs under her, under her chin that holds the pollen ball. She deposits the pollen ball on top of the female part of the plant, the stigma. And then she inserts her ovipositor into the ovary of the yucca flower, and she deposits her own eggs. She now knows that the, that, that flower will be fertilized and create seeds, which is what her babies eat. Wow. So the plant relies on her to help pollinate and fertilize each flower, and she relies on it to feed her babies. <laughs> that's fantastic. That, you it know, and that's fantastic. And I, and I, and I, yeah, and I just learned something new because I always thought that the bat was the pollinator of the yucca. Yeah, no, it's the yucca, the tiny yucca moth who only flies at night, and that's why the wow. flower. Wow, super cool. So yuccas just are great plants for uh, just for its structure. Put them right up front. So you can see them. Of course, in a public garden like this, sometimes it gets hairy putting them right up front because, you know, little kids can run into them and poke their eyes out. <laughs> We're seeing a little sedum there. And um, one of the things that, of course, the audience will notice is the generally low and rolling nature and rounded nature of most of the plants here. And that's kind of the look, Leslie, right, of a, of a yes. heather garden, right? Yes, yes. And we actually haven't even seen the heathers yet, interestingly enough. When you round the bend up there, you'll we, start. we shall, yeah. And then there's a beautiful, uh, and it looks like a, ch a weeping cherry tree. Or is that another yeah. elm? Yeah, I it might be. No, that's the, a cherry. The, the Oshino. I'm not sure. It's a cherry because it has this, cherry, the, yeah. the leaves, yeah. Yeah, that's. And then of course this is the perfect environment right under here for uh, for these this, these rhododendrons, which are so happy there. I've never seen healthier rhododendrons than these in New York. 
setting their flower buds, of course, for next year. And Leslie, we love that moth story. So if you have anything else, please. Okay. <laughs> <laughs> love the symbiotic relationships. Yeah. So now the bed on the on the right is the heather bed and the perennial bed. And the left is the animals also perennials. Right, and so and so you're seeing now the t the uh, the beginning of the massive plantings of heathers, just just a little bit further from where we are now, and this looks like more salvia, mm -hmm. and that looks like uh, not quite sure. And what is that? What is broom? Scotch broom, right? That was just scotch broom. Yeah. Uh, right here, this right, yeah, that right, right there, yeah, cytisus, I think. Yeah, standing up there, there it is. Correct, and. Um, just a lot of hydrangeas, really good use of hydrangeas, which also get beautiful fall color as well. I mean, the fall color here was unbelievable with the, and, and you know, cause everything gets that nice sun, especially that Western sun, which really, you know, gets the plants set up for fall color. Now I couldn't tell whether this is abelia it's or abelia. it's abelia. Yeah. 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 It's a really magnificent abelia. Yeah. Beautiful. And then is of that course the our, that's our roses, yep. yeah, These and are which are cool. still blooming right into fall. Mm -hmm. I just yeah. to right, and of course now we can start to see the heathers. Mm -hmm. These uh, these plants right here that I go up to are heathers. Now, mm -hmm. um, heathers, of course, are great because of the look and also the uh, the they are uh, work really well in this environment right off the Hudson River but they also flower at unusual times tell the audience a little bit about that yeah so um, the, the heather is probably still flowering but once it gets cold mm -hmm. the heath kicks in right um, G -A -T -H, and it's a similar type of plant I think it's is it the Ericaceae family yes there's two yeah. different types of heathers one is called um, uh, Kaluna, uh -huh. and one is called Erica. Erica, right. Correct. So the heat. Oh, so I always get it confused too, yeah. Leslie. Even when I was teaching plant science, I was like, D uh, which one flowers in the winter and which it's, one flowers in the spring? Right. So it's heath in the winter and heather in the summer. Heather in the summer, right. And beautiful pastels and, and, and just and covering those plants. So I've actually never been there when they've been in full flower, but it must be spectacular. And they flower in the snow. Yeah, yeah, too, right, exactly. So, so look at this view right there. I mean, how beautiful is that? With these beautiful uses of the evergreens, with the, uh, with the so you get, got your great vertical accents here, whereas everything else is kind of rounded. I mean, this is a perfect example, of, especially for my design students. Uh, of uh, of just very tasteful design, using these principles that we learned in design class to your advantage. Mm. You know, don't overdo it with the crazy shapes. You know, most gardens you want rounded. You want you want horizontal lines, rounded plants. It's more peaceful. So that's a beautiful cotinus. I love yes. that. Maybe we'll see that a little bit more oh, probably. Smoke. I'm sorry, Leslie, that didn't come through. Smoke bush. Smoke bush, right. And then here we have lamb's ear of some sort. We yeah. feel that felty leaf of the of the lamb's ear. Another great plant to put right up front. Obviously, you wouldn't see it otherwise. And this is a this is a this is a plant that's star juniper that they sell at Home Depot. You can get that. And then there's our there's our heathers. You know, you could just see the rolling nature of the heathers. Mm -hmm. Gorgeous. <clears throat> Beautiful oak leaf hydrangea with its red fall color. Leslie, this is probably bringing back some nice memories oh, for you. God, I love this garden. This this garden and this park was voted the happiest place in New York City. Really? Yeah, because people come there and they just feel so good. And yeah. during the pandemic, you know, people are out in the park just to get some nature. And it was like walking, you know, like walking through an, an outdoor museum just to, Co to take in Co the beauty Co at such a dark time. Coincidentally, my, uh, my bedroom has been... Uh, Considered the second happiest place. So that's a different story altogether. <laughs> that's a good one. <laughs> so I didn't so these, vote. We were getting we were getting too serious there. We just had to throw that in. So this is a Pinus mugo, of course. I love this, this is a planet. very yeah gorgeous example of it. And and um, one of the th reasons why I love this so much is because 
it mixes so well with the heathers. It's co- sort of a similar shape, you know, these this low and and rounded and uh, so but it, interesting. Yeah, but it has a very interesting texture and so p- that's P I N U S M U G O, Pinus mugo. It's a dwarf pine. Sometimes you can get them there's one at NYBG that's the size of a tree like a normal tree almost, but but Let's usually that's yeah, yeah. You see more right. And then of course there's sedum, sedum autumn joy, and there's baptisia. And this is a great example of actually using a taller plant, this baptisia, right up front, um, to sort of break the rhythm of uh of just everything being too low in the front. So it's a really nice example. I think I have to go. Oh, okay. I have to go help my husband. All right, Leslie. Well, uh, listen. I'll come back. I'm just going to stop this for a minute. I'm okay, gonna... great. That's fine. Right. Thank you. Uh, um, if you want to pause for a second, you mentioned before about uh, Homestead. Now, this was his son, obviously, that was involved with this. But as far as you know, the the uh, the big wigs themselves, they not only did this, but they did um, morning. Well, they did Central Park, you know. But they also did Morningside Park, so you've got mm-hmm. that. Um, in Brooklyn, um, they did Prospect Park. I think you probably already knew that. Prospect Park is unbelievable. I've never even walked through all of that. That's I, crazy I, big. Brooklyn is a still somewhat of a mystery to me. I mean, I've been there a million times, but as a musician, but never really, never really explored too much of the borough. But uh, Prospect Park, I hear, is yeah, is really really nice. I mean, I've been so much of my life in central park i mean it's my backyard i mean i know it left and right and up and down inside out but prospect park it's just it's it's almost scary how how monstrous it is but yeah but just as beautiful and then um, biggest yeah biggest park in new york i think it is and then and van Cortlandt might be might be one of the one of the biggest too but van Cortlandt is is just raw woods and then you know a couple athletic fields yeah exactly and of but, course, um, Van Cortland. Those go- Sorry, go, go ahead. ahead. No, Van no. Cortland. Of course, Van Cortland Park played a, a part in my true crime uh, investigations. A lot of satanic activity took place up there as well. But I wanted right. to stop and show this view here, which I thought was great, framed by this whatever tree that is. I couldn't quite tell. You know, imagine the vision, right? 1930, right? And this guy is buying all the land on the other side of the Hudson, like you said. Because even then he's like, "Hey, man, this is the New York City is growing big, and th- these views are not going to last forever unless right. we do something to preserve it." So, you know, I people mean, like to insult all these guys, right? The, um, you know, they, you know, they love to call them all sorts of horrible names, right? But the fact is, they put their money to some great use. You know, they, all the they money did. they made I mean, in steel and the rest of it, the museums, right. I mean, the the libraries. This guy just was like, okay, let me buy this plot of land. And you know what? Uh, across the river there, I'm going to buy that land too to protect the views from here. I mean, you know, it's, mm-hmm. uh, yeah. But uh, this is a plant that I was so happy to get a, 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 a video of because this is a very rare plant, actually, that, that is super hardy and people should use more. This is called Calicarpa. And the uh, uh, we're gonna see uh, th- this is uh, the common name is beautyberry. Now it's out of out of leaf almost, but look at those purple fruits, and and the wow. camera doesn't even do it justice. Um, but it, these these shrubs are festooned with these clusters of purple fruit, not edible, at least for humans. But um, I was gonna say it's Asian... for, for birds, isn't it? Yeah. yeah, it's for birds, and and it and it's a very Asian style plant and uh, a very designer plant. I'm gonna be using. So Leslie, we were just showing the calicarpa. Oh, gorgeous! And uh, I don't want to give away anything or 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 anything, but um, I might be getting a, a a job at this building called the White Hall in in uh, in Riverdale, and I already have designed where I cal- live. Well, we didn't want to say we didn't want to say that. <laughs> But um, but but uh, I have I have a lot of plans for Calicarpa in your in your garden. Oh, and you know, can you do you have a close up of the berries? I, I just showed them. Oh, okay. Because Here, the, the me, migrating birds depend on them. Well, um, let's. Why, why don't you tell them? We can rewind that a little bit. There's not right, too much so, left of the video. 
the common name is beautyberry, right? Because they're, they're just like hanging amethysts. Yeah. And um, but but they're really great for the birds. I mean, there's so many birds that rely on these berries, um, not only when they're migrating, but even the birds that stay here year round, like robins, uh, mockingbirds. Um, love the the beauty berries. Yeah, and man. I really hope I get that Whitehall gig because that's Me that too, would be Manny. The, the return of Manny Grossman to the Me scene. Me too. <laughs> it's been do. too long. Um, but uh, and that elm on the left, that's that's a Siberian elm on the left. I had shown a vista of that. It was absolutely beautiful. Yeah. Now this yeah. was a special moment for me. Uh, I realized that this was not a scared squirrel. <laughs> so I just zenned out on the squirrel for a little Aww. bit. <laughs> we have all felt... kinds of mammals in that park. Skunks, uh, woodchucks, flying squirrels. It's such a haven. It is, oh, and, and, oh. and this thing just was not scared. No. The only time I've ever experienced non-scared squirrels was in Montreal. They come right up to you, and, yeah. they, and they get into your lap and everything. Yeah. Aw, he's a little sweetie. Yeah, I, I felt bad. I didn't have anything. I was tricking him. <laughs> oh. <laughs> there he goes. We're going to see him again. Don't worry. <laughs> so tell us um, about the birds and the migration in this place a little bit. Yeah, so it, it, there's so many species of warblers that show up. Um, and nest here, and then you know the end of the summer, um, where you know they know it's time to leave because soon there won't be any insects for them to eat, and so right. they make their way south. But we have many different species that are here year round: species of woodpeckers, um, red-bellied, um, downy. Um, now I know nothing very... about I know nothing about birds. I really I really don't. But one of the th it, is it true that birds actually live most of the year south and then they come north for the winter? No. Is that really the way we should think about it? I mean, no, north for the no. summer, I should say. So birds have their feeding grounds and their breeding grounds, okay. uh, the ones that migrate. And and in order to find food, they would stay warm enough up here. They just can't find food. And so hummingbirds need nectar, right? They can't find food up here. And all the birds that eat insects. So they have to fly south. So, and okay. Some of them may just go as far as, I don't know, North South Carolina, something like that, or Maryland even, um, where they can find some food. The mm -hmm. rest are omnivores. And so in the summer, they feed insects to their babies. Um, but during the rest of the year, they, they, they're fine eating seeds and berries. Um, and, and those are the birds that stay here year round. Mm -hmm. And so, of course, this is a cautionary tale for you gardeners out there to plant plants that you could, will feed your birds in the winter. Put in the beauty berries, put in the hollies, put in the viburnums. And hawthorns and, uh, yeah, important, very, very important. Right. Viburnums especially are, are important because they love to nest in them as well. And here we see hellebore. Mm -hmm. Beautiful. I mean, just beautiful design here. I mean, is, is Rhonda, is she an NYBG person too? I think she is, um, you know, part-time instructor. Yeah, at NYBG. I think I've, I think I've seen her name, Rhonda, Rhonda Brands, right? Brands, B R A N D. Yeah, she Brand. Yeah, she's a she's a, a NYBG, and uh, that's pretty much it. We're at that's the good. end of end of the little tour here. Um, we'll just take one quick look south again. I mean, I'm sorry, north again. What are these? That 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 is a um, Japanese tree lilac. There Ooh. were two trees that fused together, um, and they're, they're, they're very old. Um, I usually don't see such big Japanese tree lilacs. Yeah, I, ca I cannot believe that's a lilac. Mm -hmm. So, yeah. guys, this is a wonderland for plant enthusiasts, wildlife mm -hmm. enthusiasts. Just a great place to go on an afternoon. And that's it, my friends. Scott, we're done with the presentation. Thank you. Very cool. Awesome. That was great. Very, very cool. It was. It was great having you, Leslie. I mean, thank you, you really... for, for inviting me. No, yeah. very, very welcome. I mean, it really worked out great because you provided really commentary that I could never have. I'm good on the plants, but you really you really threw in a lot of color there. I was very happy about that. <laughs> thank you. So what are we looking oh, at here? My what website. Exactly... <laughs> yeah. So that is indeed your website. So what are we looking at? What's going on here? 
Okay, so field guide to the neighborhood birds of New York City on the left, on the right, field guide to the street trees of New York City in the center, Honeybee Hotel. Oh, yeah, I'm just kind of bouncing birds. around. Yeah. So birds of New York City. So what is that? This is your book and how to right. order it. Yeah. yeah. And then you've got, so this is one book and then you've got Honeybee Hotel, Parks of New right. York City, it's about, Trees of it's New York City. It's about the life of a honeybee, of honeybees. Um, but also it's the history of the Waldorf Astoria Hotel and the Ooh, honeybee really? hives that lived on the roof garden in the Waldorf. Uh oh, you wow. got you just you just opened up a can of worms. <laughs> yeah, Why? very very cool. This so how do people order them stuff. through through Amazon or directly through your website? Yeah, yeah, yeah. Through Amazon would be great. <laughs> okay, very cool. And what are you, what do you typically do to promote your books? Not much. You do book signings. <laughs> <you don't? laughs> I give. I used to before the pandemic lead a lot of walks. Now I do all my talks on Zoom, um, mainly for the Fort Tryon Park Trust but also mm -hmm. for New York Historical Society and um, in different places. And I'm working on my fifth book on the Hudson River now. And so, you know, when you write these books, these, these nonfiction books, um, you don't do it for the money. <laughs> you do it for the love of, you know, of spreading the word about the natural world here in the city. Yeah. So much. Definitely. Well, it's important. I mean, we still need books to be written. <laughs> There's still people out there reading them, thankfully. Thankfully. So, very, very cool. Awesome. Well, thank so, you, guys. You're yeah, very really welcome. appreciate you being here. Okay. okay so, uh, Manny, what's the story for uh, for the future? Are you sticking around? You're going to Puerto Rico? What's your plan for the coming weeks? Uh, well, right other... now I'm I'm in a in, I'm in a little bit of a holding pattern. I'm waiting to see whether I get this big account. Um, called the white hall and uh leslie seems very interested in you're getting that gig <laughs> yes well, yeah i would love to get it and and uh if i don't get it i'm in a lot of trouble but if i if i do get it i can save my business and uh and and return to hopefully the glory that i once had in this city <laughs> and uh but uh, i'll be heading down to puerto rico for a couple months uh starting in december because i also have a farm down there that i'm cultivating and planting trees and uh i you know i got into gardening to basically move to that farm and 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 when i went there in 2008 after my first year of gardening uh, being trained at Wave Hill, I, re I quickly realized I didn't know what the hell I was doing. So I needed more training and I ended up, you know, having a really great career in New York. Um, it got a little dismantled and, uh, you know, so I, I am at a crossroads in my life and I'm, I, I don't know exactly what's going on. That's all I can really say. All right. Well, you know, you've got a lot of support, so we'll see what we can do about making more of these videos, maybe even in Puerto Rico, shoot something here and there. I mean, it's beautiful. I'm definitely that blogging from Puerto Rico. Definitely. Yeah, that sounds good. Leslie, we'd love to have you back again. You were great. The chat really loved thank having you. you. Thank so, you. Thank very, you. very cool. In fact, if you want to come on anytime, we could talk about your books and talk about anything you like. It'd be great. Okay. All, All right. right. You're always thank welcome you. to. All right. Thanks. Well, hang out for a second, you guys. Give me a second to just say goodnight to everybody. Um, so thanks for joining us for another episode of Historic Gardens. And without a shadow of a doubt, this most certainly was a historic garden. So we're glad you're here. Do me a favor and check out Manny's channel. Uh, the link is below. He's got a couple of channels, but the one that we're mainly interested at this point is the one about the gardens. What What's the name of that one, Manny? That's called Gardening Uncensored with Manny Grossman. All the things I wasn't allowed to say when I was a teacher at NYBG. <laughs> exactly. So go to his channel, subscribe to his channel, watch his videos, like his videos. And then in the comment section below, if you could leave a comment, you know, more than four words. Hey, Manny, you're awesome. I love this video. You know, whatever you want. But do that because the whole algorithm thing likes it. Uh, we want to get uh, Manny up and running straight away so we can monetize his channel and that includes not only subscribers but it includes view hours and so even if you saw one of the videos that he's done watch it again why not and then as far as leslie as you can see right here she's got a great website it is leslie day dot new york city and she's NYC. got quite a number of nyc, NYC. <laughs> yeah i can't help it i'm one of those people i see nyc and it's like new york city i know <laughs> yeah, NYC. Um, but I, I don't even, I don't do the LOL thing because I don't think anybody does. I don't think the brain understands what <laughs> LOL means. Nobody reads that as anything. 
except lol. But um, but anyway, so you can see that she's got these great books. So check them out. And for all those who are who are um, kind of here, um, well, pay attention. I might be doing a private stream on Rumble in a little while, but I'll talk about that. Keep an eye on Twitter, but I might be doing that in about an hour or so. But more on that later. All right, you guys, hang tight and let's Thanks, just say good night to everybody. Thanks everybody for being here. We really night, appreciate guys. it. Thank night. you, Leslie. Great addition. Thank Thanks, you. guys, in the in the chat. Really appreciate yep. it. See you next time. All right.